Welcome to Win the Day with Wasson, presented by MarketScale in partnership with WTD Consulting. Let's deep dive into the principles and perspectives that have shaped the winning mindsets with our guests focused on driving people performance. Confident our guests can help you unlock the coveted it factor that we believe is a learnable trait enabling the separation for success in a world of human commoditization. I'd like to welcome our Win the Day with Wasson community. We are in for a real treat, unless you're from the state of Wisconsin, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But we are privileged to have a former teammate, an icon uh, as a former quarterback, one of the most highly sought after dual threat guys in the country, a native of Lowell, Michigan. We, we brought him over to Oklahoma for a short time. Keith Nickel, welcome to Win the Day with Wasson. Appreciate you having me, Chase. Keith, I can't thank you enough for joining. I, I know your story probably better than anyone as I've had a tremendous amount of respect to following your journey and really seeing the work that you've put in. It's put yourself in a position now to be really recognized uh, as, as CEO of Carrera Capital. But let's deep dive, man. I mean, a lot of folks see the success you've had on the field, but don't know the work that it took to put yourself there. Can you give our audience, Keith, some perspective of how does a guy from Lowell, Michigan, who's probably been winning since he's been in diapers, end up in Oklahoma and then back to the great state of Michigan. Just give us your journey, Keith. Yeah, no, I appreciate the platform here, and uh, thanks for having me on. But, uh, yeah, going all the way back to my childhood, you know, athletics and sports were always a part of my life. Uh, starting around nine years old, started playing football. And what's funny, a lot of people don't know is that I left extreme sports more, you know, so skateboarding and dirt bikes and four-wheelers. And, you know, we lived in a, a small town with a lot of land in the farming community. And so uh, that's the way I grew up was kind of with, you know, a lot of open air, uh, right? Dirt bikes, doing those types of things, working outside with my dad. And, uh, football was something that, you know, I caught on to quick. I was blessed young to uh, have certain talents. I always run and jump and do those things. Had an arm and the guy gives you certain talents, but then you know, I was fortunate to have a dad and a family that was extremely supportive that was a great role model for me what it meant to work extremely hard be disciplined almost in the military style be very regimented uh put your head down shut up and get to work kind of mentality that's why i grew up very blue collar um had a lot of success in high school and i'm very fortunate won a state championship as a sophomore on our varsity team considered maybe the greatest football team in the state of Michigan ever. Uh, the team was just dominant. Um, I don't think I played the second half on probably nine games that year. That was just a great team. So that really helped the recruiting process for me and was getting offers almost you know, instantly from Purdue, Cincinnati, Michigan State, Wisconsin, all you name it around the country. Uh, was fortunate to get scholarship offers very young. Um, fast forward into summer of my junior, you know, going into my junior year after my sophomore season, you know, offered by John L. Smith, going to Michigan State. I wanted to be Drew Stan if you remember him. He just retired from the NFL, had a great career. We had a similar offense, spread option, quarterback is the man, right? He's running, passing, doing it all. That's what a nice one. I want to continue to do that my hometown team. Uh, they fired John L. Smith. I re my recruitment and Bob Stoops and Josh Heibel, uh were in my living room on a Sunday, the day after you guys won the Big 12 Championship Kate on a Saturday. So, you know, he said, come check us out. I did. And, you know, I went down to Oklahoma. And at the time, as you remember, Chase, like, if you played Oklahoma, you're going to the NFL. And, you know, Trent Williams is there. He's not Trent Williams yet, but he was there. Greatest alignment maybe ever in the NFL. Adrian Peterson's getting ready to graduate. Bob Kelly's there. The list goes out of talent. Joe McCoy, DeMarco Murray, you know, the list goes out. So I want to go to a ones. I have a chance to go on to the NFL because I felt like, hey, decent chance of playing. There was no starting quarterback. Rick uh, Bomar had just been suspended. Though we knew who Sam Bradford was yet. Joey Halsley with a Juco transfer. Uh, you were just coming in shortly thereafter, right? Like telling a guy, but nobody, there was no defiant starter yet. Like, so I thought it was a great opportunity as a freshman to play. And uh, I did, did red shirt. Uh, Sam took off though. It was a fantastic starter for us. You know, the, you know, the number one overall pick. 
as a trophy winner. And I'm not, I was sitting there, I'm like, well, I'm not going to wait now for a guy who's in my grade to, uh, there'll be a hurt or go on to the NFL. Both things end up happening. He gets hurt a little bit. And, uh, you know, early on, you know, goes to the NFL right after his junior year. But uh, transferred back to Michigan State, did a spirit QB competition with Kirk Cousins. But when we were the same age and grade now at the time, a year with the playbook, you know, longer than I had. But similar to Sam, they, the fact that Kirk was perfect for like the Michigan State offense, or a drop back quarterback, stay in the pocket. Sam was fantastic in the shotgun, super accurate, feed it to your playmakers and get out of the way. I know we did that better than Sam, my experience, you know, of any quarterback I've ever been around. So, Kirk was perfect for our offense. Sam was at for. Oklahoma, probably a half a billion dollars worth of uh, career earnings there between the two, potentially. And, um, you know, I dislocated my elbow in that competition with Kirk, which is really the genesis of what kind of gave him, you know, curved that opportunity to kind of continue you know, running the team as a quarterback there. Um, dislocated my elbow against Illinois in the game I started at one. It's great. But then now I'm an athlete, quarterback. Dislocated an elbow. They need help at wide receiver. And when I reflect back on my childhood, I wanted to be the greatest athlete, the greatest player. I never wanted to be the quarterback or the running back. I just wanted to be the best player on the field. Put me where I need to play so we can win football games. Like that was always my mentality. And uh, that came kind of full circle when Michigan State needed a wide receiver after some suspensions up the field. And I essentially started two and a half, you know, three years, whatever you want to call it, a playing wide receiver at Michigan State. Well, I appreciate that summary, Keith. And and I really want to dive into some of the the, the granularity of details that, that helped you progress, you know, mentally, some of the adversity that you overcame through those experiences to ultimately, and I touched on this early on, put yourself in Michigan State in a position to win a Big Ten championship as a senior, and, and, and probably yourself and the team go down in history as the, the most electric play uh, when you caught the Hail Mary. And we'll dive into that a little deeper. But aside from the state of Oklahoma being, you know, really mad at you when you left as, as you were, you know, a, you know, a tremendous talent coming in there. I know for myself, Keith, uh, you referenced, you know, state title as a sophomore, being from Texas, I think, you know, the Dragons of 2002, we'd have loved to have seen you guys, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, but for our audience, Keith, and this is one thing that, you know, coming in as a graduate transfer, you know, I had a degree. I saw something in your eye. I saw the mentality, the the workmanship, and really the chip on your shoulder where here's a guy, an 18-year-old kid coming down from Michigan, you know, into a locker room, as you touched on, filled with Tremendous amount of talent, a, a lot of different egos, a lot of different personalities. And Keith, your Lutch Pell mentality as far as work ethic, being the first guy on the field, kind of being a sponge to Sam, and really diving right into competition is something I want to really highlight and get your perspective on. What was your mindset coming in as one of the top dual threat recruits in the country, Elite 11 participant? You walk into OU expecting to become the starter. Walk us through that experience and how it sharpened your sword mentally to prepare you for that transfer into the next moves throughout your career that you touched on. Yeah, that uh, that experience in Oklahoma was maybe the single greatest experience in terms of forging me as a as a man and as an athlete. You know, it's there's something to be said that you go to a place that's unfamiliar. Parents are, you know, the kids just drive down you know, an hour or two to, to help you out if you get a flat tire, you know, as an analogy, you know, so you're on your own and you're building your relationships with people who are not from the same part of the country as you are with very different cultures. You've got to test this on this, Chase, you know, guys from Louisiana, um, who if you're not from Louisiana, you can't really understand what they're saying at first, but you get the hang of it, you know, guys from Dallas, Texas, you guys have from Arlington, Texas, you guys from the middle of places you've never heard of in Texas, all the way up to California, cultures from all over the place. And so, you know, 
that was a, a, a great forging opportunity for me. Um, and don't get me wrong, I came in, you know, intimidated without question. I mean, you're around athletes. Everybody's a five star, everybody's a four star, right? But me being a five star was not like some something to celebrate there, right? Like those guys were everywhere. So sure, it was humbling, but I was, you know, I never had the mentality that I didn't belong. In fact, I always felt like I belonged. And I knew I was going to compete and I wasn't going to get punked. Yeah, you'd be intimidated by all you want, but at the end of the day, like once you put the hell on and you start playing, you're like, you're in your zone and you're playing. So, you know, Overall, it taught me a lot, and uh, what it really taught me is that, you know, just because you're a great player, you put your head down and you work your ass off, uh, that doesn't guarantee anything in life. That's a business in particular, right? It just gives you a great chance of having success. It doesn't guarantee success. So that was my first experience with that kind of lesson, because up until then, I was taught you work your ass off and good things come from it, which happened all through high school and after my recruiting process, my first parts of my career at Oklahoma. Then, you know, Sam does a great job with the team. It's like, hey, listen, the stars aligned for him. It was his time. And he took care, he took advantage of that. So what it taught me is, hey, you gotta work harder. Gotta put your head down even more. Again, nothing's guaranteed, but give yourself a better chance, you know, the next time you have it count. And uh they'll look back. And that's all you can do. And so um no, that's perfectly said, um, Keith, especially for guys that, that have never been, you know, in your shoes, you know, walking out in front of a hundred plus thousand, expecting to be the man. Now, all of a sudden you're on the sideline, you're watching, you're observing, but you took that as a life lesson to get yourself sharper to then have success, you know, at your next stop, which was Michigan State. One thing I also heard you talk through that I think is very applicable, even in the business sector, and I think it's why you're successful you know, even now as CEO at Career Capital, hard work is the expectation. That's almost a ticket to get you in the game, right? right? I mean, dishwashers work hard, uh, our cars work hard, but you figured out a way not only to work hard, but to work smart and then to go back home. And I know trust, I know loyalty, I know maintaining relationships is something that you're big on at the firm that you represent right now. But walk our audience through, Keith, how did you land at Michigan State? What was that process like for you? And, and talk about the power of relationships that led you back to Michigan State in the first place. Yeah. Well, let me start by saying I appreciate touching on the loyalty and the trust thing. You know, being from a small town, it's like your word is everything. Your loyalty is everything. And so it was very hard to move on from Oklahoma. Like, I was ready to look for myself in the mirror and stick it all the way through and say, listen, like you may or may not ever play. And uh, your dreams were likely not going to come true based on the information in front of me with Sam being entrenched as the starter, doing a great job. There's no guarantees he's going to leave early. You don't know the amount of success he's going to continue to have, how good they were going to be. But, um, you know, I'd say a lot, of, actually my teammates of Oklahoma let me off the hook on some of that, that guilt. Because they said, listen, man, we love you. We want what's best for you. And um, we'll always be boys, you know. And so go be great. You know, like the situation here is not ideal. Uh, it's not like corner, right? There's two of them and one there. And like, this is the quarterback. That's the most protected position of the, of the field. So long story short, I always had a great relationship with Mark D'Antonio. Mark D'Antonio recruited me. He was at Cincinnati. He had just been hired at Michigan State. Shortly after John L. Smith being fired, but I was graduating early. So he was, he was just kind of like doing his press conferences, right? Like just becoming the head coach. But he, when I went to Oklahoma, I decommitted from Michigan State, but I decommitted to M technically because he is now the head coach. I remember he said, he, if you ever want to come home, you'll always have a scholarship here. Now I'll never forget it. I, I didn't forget it. And that taught me a life lesson on never burning a bridge, right? He could have, be surprised, coaches them out, you know, uh, high school kids for the commitments and whatever. He never did that. He was a gentleman and he didn't burn that bridge. And so I that always stuck in the back of my head when I was contemplating coming back. Remember, you talked about Stoops, like, here, I'll leave here. Mark D'Antonio was a guy. He's, he's a guy I would advocate for. They were brothers, you know, not brothers, 
by blood, but the coaching lineage that comes from um, Youngstown, Ohio, they're all in that circle, right? So he vouched for Antonio and, you know, a couple of conversations led to another. And I was you know, letting Stooge know I was going to move on and go play for Coach Antonio. And he said, I'm happy for you, Keith. I'm really sad to see you go. I'm happy that it'll be in a great place. So, Well, and I, I think that, Keith, uh, you know, it, it's obviously – character of coach stoops in the program to recognize not only your talent but be supportive and help you along that journey um obviously you get to michigan state uh it it sounds like keith you're a magnet for competition i don't know if that's uh, something you you plan to be i I, I guess in your business now you're very well networked with a lot of affluent individuals that you met during that time that you can be a, a value add but I want to position something to you, and I don't know if you've heard this in a while, and I hope all of our listeners from Wisconsin are sitting down. I I don't want to cause cardiac arrest, but I want you to take us in the huddle, in your mindset. It's 2011, and you hear, gun rip wide, 62 dash rocket. What's next? (laughs) Well, what's next is going to be a play that goes down, you know, and it for me with Michigan State fans and some Wisconsin fans of there, there's anyone listening. But I would say it's funny about that play as an athlete. You know, momentum is everything. When you're playing, you can feel it. It's a very real thing, especially in college sports, college football, college basketball. We were fortunate to be at home playing that game, college game day, the whole crew, night game. I mean, it doesn't get more electric than that. Wisconsin's on their way to probably go play the national championship game if they don't lose a game like they're about to us, right? Um, it's a tie ball game. They had a momentum, right? Like they had just scored. They were playing great at the bladder part of the fourth quarter. We get it with a minute and a half left. We're just hoping to get to a position where we could throw a hell back, right? And then not going to overtime with the great running backs that they had, James White. Anyway, they had it, Russell Wilson, those guys. They were, they were an elite football team. We were trying to get to an elite football team, right? So, a couple of things going on there. They actually called the, the play to the field, which means the wide side of the field. Call a timeout, a little bit to the boundary, which is the play you just called, so the near side of the field. I'm supposed to be the tip man. So, in the triangle, three players are supposed to be that tip man. BJ was supposed to be in my spot, and... Uh, the odd sense was where he was supposed to be. BJ Cunningham is an NFL receiver. Played for the Dolphins, played in Canada for a while. He the all-time leading receiving receiver at Michigan State in our history of great receivers. He was catching everything that game. If you put it if his hand touched it, he was catching it. So we flipped spots and put BJ in my spot because the thought was if BJ gets his hand in the ball, which is supposed to go to the spot that he's now going to be in, the he'll catch it, right? And then my job was to catch a chip if it comes. Be two yards shy of the goal. The only ball you can catch that gate was that ball. It's him like through the hands in the helmet, bounces off his head, right where he should have had, right? And then to my arms and um, you know, as an athlete, you know, Chase, like everything's in slow motion. And even at talk to yourself, it's so slow in your head, right? Like I'm thinking it's game over, I right? but catch this and uh, it's over. Um, catch it, and it was not over. About four or five guys, you know, trying to tackle me and drag me back, and had twist and jolt my boiled body across the goal line, and fortunately won that game. But it was not by a lot; it was probably by this much of the football, right, a couple inches. And um, pandemonium went off after that because it took about a ten minute review, call it a touchdown, the place went went nuts, completely nuts. Well, and I think the number seven you were wearing that night, Keith, is is what what has made yourself a legend in, in Michigan State Spartan history, but also put your team in a position to win uh, and, and be a part of the, the Big Ten Championship. So really appreciate you giving our audience just a sneak peek behind the curtain. And one thing I heard, and this is a constant theme I'm hearing with you, Keith, opportunity, taking advantage of the right opportunity. And that those are things that are transferable right in and not just athletics but these are things where and you commented on your work ethic for those that probably don't understand the differences in quarterback and receiver to have success at that high of a level and to really retrain your brain your body your mind 
to ultimately put yourself in a position to make that play is something that I'm sure your teammates, you know, it didn't go unnoticed. And, and I don't know the state of Oklahoma and all your former teammates were, were ecstatic to see you push across the goal line. So minus being from the state of Wisconsin, Keith, I think our, our, our community is, is elated to hear that. Uh, and, and for those from Wisconsin, there is Berlenta, which is a uh, you know cardiometabolic medication for heart attack that's available. Uh, but man, appreciate you sharing that. And uh, the other thing I really wanted to get more clarity on, Keith, and no one better to provide perspective than yourself. But you've been around a lot of extreme talents, a lot of tremendous leaders, coaches, athletes. Part of the concept we discuss on Win the Day with Watson Keith is, is trying to unlock that it factor that a lot of these individuals have. In your mind, do you have any examples of individuals, teammates, friends, coaches that you've identified, man, that's what makes that person tick? And if everybody could unlock that, the world would be a much better place and there'd be so much more success because of it. Yeah, I mean, the greatest common denominator I've seen amongst the ultra successful, the most elite of success has been uh, discipline. And you know, discipline is the greatest form of self-love, right? It's sacrificing what you want in the moment for what you really want in the future. And, you know, I could take on a, a laundry list of great athletes that have been around that you know, were the embodiment of discipline. I know DeMarco Murray's one, without question. I mean, that guy still operates like a tier one athlete. Like, ooh, he's a coach for Oklahoma now, but still trains, he's, he's a monster. And same with discipline, everything that he did. Socially in particular, but in this work ethic and how he did things. Her cousin's mentally disciplined. Um, probably more so now than he ever was. And even that, it was extreme, his discipline. Um, Gerald McCoy uh, at Oklahoma. Trent Williams is a guy that, to me, was just an yeah. insane combination of God's gift athletically, and then a great work ethic. Adrian Peterson would be another one, right? Um, but they're all varying degrees, but discipline's without question the single greatest common denominator. What I love about discipline is that everybody can do it. It's 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 not about talent. It's just anybody can be can create discipline for themselves. Right? It's just a matter of habit, doing things you don't really feel like doing. In fact. No, I think that's very well said, Keith. And I think it goes down to not just discipline, and you touched on this, it's it's choice. It's choosing to, whether it's make the right decision, whether it's investing in, what you know, if you're an athlete, your body, your sleep, your regiment to, to create success in business. If you choose to, you know, build your network, leverage your network, take advantage of opportunities. The individuals you referenced have all figured out not only how to be uber discipline, but take that discipline and then capitalize on, you know, their individual attributes to then, you know, just build tremendous careers. But more importantly, and this is what I want to dig into, and this will resonate with you as a quarterback, impact others. This is something I've seen as a theme with you professionally, Keith, that, that, that maybe we can dive into. And, and it probably stems back to just that mindset you've had as, as a team guy, as an athlete. But give our audience some perspective of the concept of team in your eyes and some of the life lessons through athletics that, that have helped shape, you know, your mission as you've scaled career capital. Yeah. So, you know, I have a son now who's three years old. And one of the questions I get is, uh, will you let him play football? And I think, and I'm biased, but I think football is the greatest sport in the world. And it's not even close. Why is that? Um, not one player on a football team has a very high level dominate and take over a football game by himself. He can't do it all by himself. Basketball, you can do that. Hockey, you can do that, in my opinion. Um, baseball, if you have the hot bat, you can do things. I mean, there, but football is very unique, right? There's chess. There's a chess game going on out there. Why am I sharing that? Um, if you want to go... No, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
Football teaches you that. Football te- also teaches you that you can't do it all. You have to rely on your brother and trust that he's going to do, you know, a great job of what he's doing. You need to do now a great job. That'll give you a much better chance of success if you guys all do your job great. Does he guarantee anything? But he's a good chance, all right? So everybody needs to execute in unison. And in business, it's a lot like that too. Um, you can't be everything in your business, not a meaningful business. You have to have great players and great teammates on your team and trust them, pour into them, bleed into them so they can be the best version of themselves. You need to be the best person of yourself, whatever role you have to play, whether you're the CEO, the president, or if, you know, your job is you know, cleaning up at night. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You need to be the best at what you do, and everybody's going to win at that. And football taught me that, uh, which is why I owe so much to football and to football and to Michigan State. They have taught me and given me everything. Uh, I feel like in my life. Well, I love to hear that. And I love that you're applying those same principles from, you know, the gridiron into your business right now. And, I, and I'm in total alignment with you. Obviously, there's a lot of different sports across the board that uh, anyone can be a part of. But I'm, I'm a big believer in, in team sports, kind of that competitive spirit and leveraging you know, all the different skill sets to ultimately, you know, have that common purpose. And then the end result is to win the day. So thank you for sharing that, Keith. Let's fast track. So you leave high school a champion. You leave college a champion. I know academics has always been, you know, something of importance to you. NFL, you had a, a, a small stint there. As we both know, NFL stands for not for long. But give our audience, Keith, some perspective on you leave a champion at Michigan State. You're now testing the waters with multiple teams, you know, to, to give yourself a shot at the NFL. What was that journey like, and how did it ultimately lead you to all the success you're having now in the financial sector? Yeah, so back to my comments about, you know, I, I owe everything to Michigan State and to football and to football, really. There was a transformative uh, not a conversation as a presentation that we had one day at Michigan State, I think it was my senior year. And my senior year, my junior year, at good seasons, but statistically not off the charts. You know, their BJ was there, and I wasn't like the number one receiver, but a very key contributor, right? So you're kind of wondering, like, what's your future in the NFL? I'm going to look like you get a chance. I'm you know, getting these projections to be, oh, hey, I saw as high as fourth round, but it was like five to free agent, and which means, you know, likely free agent, you know. So one of the transformative conversations I had or presentations, Jason, you, you know this back in your experience that presenters are coming in all the time, trying to create value outside of football. I'll never forget it. They said, why do you want, why would you want to be a player for the Dallas Cowboys when you've been on the team? And that, you know, a kid from Lowell who, don't get me wrong, make it a half million dollars, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a lot of money. But when you're thinking like that's the only way to make money, be successful is in the NFL. And you've never even heard of that amount of money before, right? I'm telling that point. But then somebody says, well, why would you want to be that? Would you be this? Like what he's saying is think fair for yourself. There's a greater life out there. There's a greater level of control. There's more success than playing in the NFL. It changed my life. Well, I, I love it, Keith. And you know what it tells me? You've always been a dreamer. Dream big. What I've seen you do, and, and obviously you're doing it right now, you're achieving bigger, which I think that stems from probably that vision you had. A big, big component we talked through here, Keith, is visualization often fuels realization. Yep. And that's kind of what I hear with you sharing that journey, especially to our audience that's, that's you know, might not be thinking as big as you are. So you have that vision. You've obviously got connectivity to to a tremendous amount of athletes and network, et cetera. Let's fast track, Keith. You've now become, you know, the CEO of your own brand. One thing I've really appreciated and admire is you've always been somewhat of an innovator and a forward thinker, but now you're really leveraging the omni-channel approach, social media, really establishing not only your, your company, but giving people an insight into what makes Keith tick. Talk about 
how you're leveraging social media, how that's scaling your business, and really the impact you're having to have on people, you know, because in the financial world, you know, just like in football, you're only as good as what you deliver. So give us some of, some of that perspective, Keith. Yeah. So, you know, as part of my role, my responsibility is to lead the vision um, of where we want to be, not today, but 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, and to help exceed our potential and to deliver the goods and put the team in place to deliver the goods for the clients that we make these promises to. All right. So that's a big wide net that you have to fill it be responsible of, but it, it can you can you can be simple in that too, right? When you really break it down, it's it's a relentless pursuit to constantly be better. But all right, check that box. It's constantly pursuing to be better than what you were today or yesterday. So win the day. Well, I love that. I say that all the time. Win the day, dominate today. I say that all the time. Um, and you know, part of that responsibility is you can have the greatest business or team challenge team, but if nobody knows about you, it doesn't matter. Right. And in our industry, the old model was to word of mouth. Um, hopefully you refer to somebody they recall. Um, I don't pick up, right? So a little old school, they put in that in the news or your local country club or whatever it is. But any other business that's social media, anybody who's paying attention to this social media is king. All the other channels are dying. People don't get their news on TV anymore. I get more news on my Twitter feed and from my Wall Street Journal app than I do from watching any amount of CNBC. Right. And so we went all in on creating a brand and doing a marketing campaign into social media in particular. The next wave will be our internal marketing and the things we're doing for you know, client experience and those things. But you know, Chase, you know this, you can hire that stuff externally with firms that pre-exist where you pay me up 20, 25 grand, 30 grand a year. They're kind of dedicated to you, kind of not like it's never going to be what you want. Expectations will not be there. Before you can go all in, pay three times, I've just done a round number, uh, four times, whatever the number is. Hire it internally. There will be lag time, right? You're not going to get ROI. I hate the word ROI. Like, forget ROI. If you're great at what you're doing, the money will come later. So I don't think about money now. I think about what are we creating with the brand? What's the marketing we're creating? Well, in a hiring internally, one of the best moves I've made in our business is going all in on our social media presence and our marketing campaign. And uh, because now I think what we're experiencing is people, we have clients that can share the story of these guys deliver the goods when we talk to somebody new, it's like there's a track record of success. And now people are getting to know us more. All right, and we're on the younger side of this. You know, I'm 34. I'm that's that young. There's a lot of, you know, the TikTok generation. I'm not in that one yet. But, uh, you know, we're, we're in that genre of, of age where it's like it makes a ton of sense to be on social media blowing that up. So we've gone all in on that. Well, I think it's very smart, Keith. I think for our audience that is tuned in right now, you're obviously worth a follow at Keith Nickel, but career capital and the just the advice you give, the authenticity that that you talk through, and really, you've been a guy that's delivered in every aspect of life. Why would there ever be a question, even now, leading this team in the financial sector? Would there be any difference? So I think it's a big bet on yourself, and it's one that that will pay dividends as we talk through kind of that social you know, media, omni-channel type approach that you're doing, Keith. One thing I recently saw, and I wanted to pick your brain on, is I know you're, you're, we talked about the power of network. We talked about the individuals that you've constantly gravitated yourself to, which are winners. One winner in particular, and I think, uh, you know, our audience in Phoenix will appreciate the new ownership, but uh, let's talk about Matt, Matt Ishbia, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I hope I'm not butchering it, but you and Matt met at Michigan State. He's been all over the news now as, as the, the face that's going to rebuild and rebrand the Suns. But talk to us, Keith, about what makes Matt tick and how you, you forge the relationship there. Yeah. You know, you asked me a great question about, you know, great winners that I've been around in my life. And the only reason I didn't bring his name up was because I wasn't certain how uh, familiar of a name that would be. But, you know, as you say, I'm sure what you just said, it's like people are getting, they're finding out now and, 
what they're finding out about Matt now is what you know, I feel like I've known about him uh, in my eight and a half, ten, you know, nine year relationship with him. So Matt is, uh, without question, one of my closest friends. Number one, um, he's nine years, eight, eight or nine years older than me, but he's a part of the 2000 national championship at Michigan State. He's a walk on basketball player. From Birmingham High School, you know, Birmingham City Home High School, which is, you know, one of the more prominent, you know, nice areas in the state of Michigan. Not known for their their athletes as much, right? But uh, uh so that walks out to Michigan State. Mentally driven. And I a very good basketball players is small. Right? He's on a team with Mateen Cleves and the laundry list of talent they have there. And he's the I'll tell you, he'll tell you first, he's the third straight point guard, right? But what was he great at? He was immensely disciplined. I haven't seen anybody like him because he's so passionate about whatever it is he's doing. He wants to win in every aspect of his life. It doesn't matter what he's doing. So he's disciplined, he's passionate, and he wants to win highly competitive. He's always been an underdog, mostly because of his size, right? Nobody, no, nobody bet on Matt, Matt bet on Matt. I love that about him. Um, he built the most successful mortgage company in the world. The number one company company now, I think when he got into the business, he's not even ranked somewhere in the thousand, right? Like number 1,000. They had a couple of employees, and now they have 7,000, right? So I didn't know him. I reached out to him because he's a winner. I found out he's a winner. I wanted to get into the mind of a winner, what made him tick and why he was, he was nine years ago. He's a Michigan State guy. I'm a Michigan State guy. We're athletes at that common, but we could quickly develop a business store partnership, a friendship of trust and loyalty that can't break. And um, if you surround yourself with winners, you will become one, not by accident, but it feels like that sometimes. So like just by who you surround yourself with. And uh, I've never seen anybody like him. He is a complete machine. Uh, he does not stop. Man, I love it. Uh, you know, I've got goosebumps. I, I, I'd, I'd love to get some time with Matt because uh, if he's wired anything like you, I can only imagine uh, the pedigree. And obviously, a big fan of the Sun, so so we're pulling for for his mentality to rub off there and expect big things. Really appreciate you sharing that yeah. that side of him, Keith. The other, and I don't want to turn things negative in any sense, Keith, but you mentioned mentioned your relationship with Michigan State. I think, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of, of news in, in a negative light around the tragedy and, and events that happened there that were just unforeseen, uh, just tragic. That That's the, the, the best way to put it. Keith, as an ambassador of the university, how, how were you able to be a, you know, a sounding board or, or a voice of reasoning or just anything you have uh, for, from your lens to give hope to the university and students that were you know, tragically impacted and, and from the, our win the day community prayers are, are obviously there in support for, for that tragic event. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the selfishly difficult part about all of it is that there's nothing you can really say or do that's going to, you know, change the outcome, bring those kids back, you know, change those families and bring them back to where they were, you know, prior to that event. So there's, there's certainly a sense of helplessness. And you know, I think Coach Izzo said it really well. He's, you feel guilty because, uh, no, we're, we're going to move out in our life. But those families will never move out, you know? And so that's what kind of wrenches your heart. All you can do is support, you know? And, you know, and when you have a platform, small, big, and different, to share your support, and to put good into the world, like lead good into the world. God knows there's plenty of evil out there, needs good right now. You pour good into the world, say what you can and what the platforms you have, be there for people, you know, that's all you can do. And uh, was it, you wish you could do more, but there's really not a lot more you can do. Well, I, I know your heart is with the university and, and there's a tremendous amount of ambassadors and it's something that impacted obviously the entire country um and no one could say it better i think just we do feel helpless but you know, i'm glad there's a strong sense of community there uh across spartan nation to to be 
supportive. Kind of as we're starting to close out, Keith, you've shared a tremendous amount of pearls, uh, discipline, trust, authenticity, uh, forward thinking, dreaming big, achieving bigger. Anything else from your, the way you tick, the way you like to impact that you'd like to share with our community, Keith, that it is truly a, a differentiator for not only yourself, but the way you've created separation in life. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I appreciate you asking that. And I think the frustrating thing for people when I, uh, when they ask those questions and I get my feedback, it's usually not some secret sauce that they're open to drink, right? Or it's discipline, it's hard work. Um, it's putting yourself in really uncomfortable situations that are intensely gonna help you grow. All right, so I always seek that. That'd be maybe one nugget. Yeah, it was like, I'm seeking discomfort. If I'm like comfortable, then I get uncomfortable because I'm not growing. There's no such thing as you know, living in the gray, like you just kind of flat along. You're either go, moving forward or moving backwards, right? Um, you know, maybe the one single thing that's helped me the most, and this is what's going to go up on my extra point tomorrow, is you know, building your circles, building your inner circles. And one thing my mom taught me when I was a little kid was that you are the company that you keep. And a, a more mature version of that uh, expression that I've learned is you're the average of your five best friends. So you're to write down every attribute, wealth, success, how pretty is your wife, how good do you treat your wife, are you a good dad, you're not, are you a good businessman, are you trustworthy, loyal, all those things. And you rate all of your best friends that, your five closest friends. You are the average of those things, somewhere in the middle of all those things. And so, one thing I've sought to do is just constantly surround myself, create better relationships with higher quality people, right? Because your brain's a computer and it takes in information and it recalibrates itself based on that information that you put into it. So the more quality people, more quality information that can be around, the better off they're going to be, I'm going to be, and you're all going to win in that together. Right? And so that's the single greatest thing that's probably helped my life is to just constantly seek better company from higher quality people because you deserve it, your kids deserve it, your future kids deserve it. Uh, your grandkids, your wife, everybody deserves it. And today's the last thing I'll say that most people think that what that means is like drop your least successful friend or like, no, it doesn't. It's just protect your time and use that time to help yourself grow and get around best people on the planet that you can put your option and don't let them go, right? Like go all in with them, be loyal to them. They'll be loyal to you at the things will happen. Well, you're living proof of that, Keith, and, and it's a constant level up. I think for those that have heard your journey, complacency has never been something that you've been fond of. You've constantly seeked out competition. You've never backed down. And I think the, the words that you just shared, keep your circle tight. And there's a reason why, you know, whales, I guess, migrate together, right? They're They're constantly in a sense of surrounding themselves with those that can protect the herd, more or less. That's really uh, so I, I love that kind of mindset piece. I can't thank you enough for sharing your journey. I know selfishly being able to watch your career take off as an athlete was something I really enjoyed. And now professionally, the nuggets that you've shared to our audience are pearls that each and every one of us that are tuned in to win the day with Watson could take and hopefully scale that win the day mentality for them. One thing we like to close, Keith, and I know this will land very well, we rise, we grind, we shine, we impact. If the day ends in why, choose to win the day. Okay, thank you enough, my man, for joining Win the Day with Wasson. Continued success to you and the firm. And man, I can't wait for more nuggets to be dropped on the, uh, the social media forums. And, uh, you know, maybe one day our, our, our little ones will be teammates. That'd be great. I appreciate you, Chase. Thanks for the friendship all these years. Appreciate you. 
Absolutely, Keith. Go Sparty, and, and thanks for joining Win the Day with Watson. We look forward to the next episode.